And we're up. It is 10 o'clock. And it is episode 70. Hard to imagine. 70 episodes. Of Unhindered by Coding. Um, this is Nick McPhee. We'll be here for two hours doing more of this. Um, uh, working on, on today. The Well, hello is it too. Um, wonderful to see you here. Because we're going to wrestle with a lot of stuff that I know you have thought very hard about. So... Um, and I'm hoping there's at least one problem I'm hoping you can save me on. Um, so we, uh, have been working on trying to generalize our recombination operators and, uh, we're going to continue that today. Um, I spent some time yesterday trying to make sense of, um, where we were. And I felt like I'd, I'd written a lot of code on Sunday that I had not had a big picture understanding of. So I, I was trying to like make a little more sense out of some things um, and did make some progress, which I want to share. But I also got stuck somewhere in a way that I don't really understand and which I think is going to be relevant and probably indirectly explains some of the choices that Azitsu's made in the design that you were proposing um, on Sunday and on Discord before that. Um, and so I'm hoping that this will help me at least better understand some of those design choices um, and know why those are being made. So we're going to hopefully make some progress here. Um, so let's see, uh, first thing I want to do just to like, make sure that I have my own head wrapped around things. I was trying to like capture where we were and where we were trying to go. Um, and so at the moment, sort of before introducing the operators and all of that fancy stuff, um, we had a recombinator trait which imply which is parameterized on some genome type G and has a recombined method that takes a slice of genome of references to genomes and returns a new genome. And this works great. It just doesn't provide any way for the type checker to assist us in verifying that if we need two genomes, we're getting two genomes we're going to have to have runtime checks that the slice has got the right number of things in it. Um, and the type checker can't assist us in that. Um, and then as examples, we've got mutation and crossover are both impulse um, for that um, uh, trait with the genome type being Vec of T. Uh, and then our pipeline down here um, was uh, a struct that had a vector of recombinators. So the idea is you had a, a sequence of recombinators and you would apply them one at a time. Um, we needed the dyne because recombinator is a trait. So we don't know what particular implementations will be used. So we're sort of saying here that this will be something that implements recombinator. We don't know what that'll be. Um, and the dyne is necessary because we don't know what that will be. We want dynamic dispatch. And we need a box because the different implementations of Recombinator won't all have the same size. And the size won't be known at compile time. And a vec, everything's got to have the same size that's in a vec. So putting a box around it, basically putting the Recombinator on the heap and just having the vector be a bunch of pointers to those things. The pointers all have the same size and life is good. Um, so we can um, make this work with a box dyne approach. And then um, we can call recombine. We get a slice of genomes um, and also some other stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm oversimplifying up here when I just say these take a slice of genomes. They also take for example, the uh, thread RNG. Um, but I have to special case the first one. 
So the first one um, uh, can... Uh, the first one can take a, um, a slice that might have more than one, but all of these return a single genome. So once we have the first one, then everything else will take a single genome and then stick it inside of a slice when passing it to recombine. So that, that's a little awkward that have to treat the, um, the first one differently. Um, and that would be one thing that Azitsu's proposal would fix. Um, and then in um, writing up notes for Azitsu's proposal um, as an alternative, um, so Azitsu, the key, a key piece of Azitsu's proposal is this operator type that is parameterized on an input type and a population type. Um, it has an associated type output and it has a single method apply that takes an input and a reference to a population and returns an output. Um, uh, so it's taking, if we think of like mutation, our input might be a, a single genome and we return a single genome. So these might both be VEC of bool. Um, but we could also have an input that had a pair of genomes, um, and then perform some kind of crossover and returned a single genome. So input might be, um, a tuple or a, an array of size two. Um, and then the type checker, let's say it's an array of size two, the type checker, because it knows that the input is always going to be an array of size two, the type checker can help make sure that we're never applying an operator in a context where we don't have the right type. Whereas on this approach, since we just handed a slice, we don't have any idea what the length of this is and the type checker can't help us out. Um, so this gives us both flexibility in interesting ways because we're um, capturing the input and output types um, in cool ways, but it also allows the type checker to do things. Now, one thing I noticed when I got into this is that this is basically the FN trait in Rust. It isn't exactly that, um, and the differences matter, but it is essentially the FN trait. Um, so the FN trait takes args, is parameterized by args, which is essentially our input, and in the FN trait, the args have to be a tuple, um, uh, we are not constraining our input in such a way. Uh, we've got an associated output type and where Izitsu called it apply, they call it call. Pretty much the same idea though. Um, we're going to call the function on these arguments and we're going to get an output. Um, so the, the, there's a couple of things that are different. One is the constraint that this be a tuple, which is its use proposal doesn't have. And the other being that this takes a pop um, as a, a reference to a population as an argument. And um, uh, their, obvious, their system obviously doesn't like, that's a very particular uh, trait. Well, that's a bad word, um, feature um, for our scenario. Now, this is only necessary for operators like selectors that need to select a new genome from the population. All the recombinators like um, crossover and mutation, none of them should need um, this argument. They'll, they'll ignore this argument. Um, and so there's a question about whether selectors should be treated separately or should be folded in um, with the whole thing. Um, a, if you didn't have this, then um, operators really would be almost exactly the same as FNs. Um, and the only major distinction would be the tuple bit. Um, so once I figured that out, I was like, okay, let me back out of all the evolutionary computation stuff 
because there's a lot going on there. And apologies for the glaring sunlight. Let's see if I turn this light on. Does that sort of provide a little balance? Not a lot. The sun is very strong at the moment. Um, but it's nice. It's warm solar radiation and it's cold in the house. It's cold outside of the house. Um, it's, we had a very cold, um, week and yesterday, um, I think the high was like just a hair above zero Fahrenheit. Um, and the low was considerably below that. Um, so it's kind of nice having the sun. Hello, sun. Um, but it, it doesn't make for great, um, lighting here on the internet. So apologies. Um, so I was like, okay, in the context of our evolutionary computation, there's a lot going on. There's mutators and two point crossover and all of this stuff. And I was like, okay, I want to, I'm getting lost in, in all of that weed, weed and I'm not getting a, a big picture understanding of what the heck's going on. And so I decided to kind of step back a little bit and think about what these things mean in a setting, in a simpler setting. And do I understand what's going on and what the issues are? And so I'm going to walk through that until I run into a problem, um, which I will run into in a hot second. Um, but we got a few things we can exp uh, go over first. Let's see, are we compiling? Uh, no, I need to comment that out and then we'll compile, I think. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, so one thing I was, you know, hunting around and there's an interesting web page um, here that explains functional programming jargon in Rust. So there's a lot of language in functional programming about different concepts. And they talk about, well, like, how do those map to Rust? Well, that was interesting. And with examples. And one of the uh, pieces of jargon, which I would actually say is, you know, a pretty common concept in math, um, is function composition. <clears throat> and so they had... These code examples come from there, but I've seen similar things in other places. Um, and this is this will turn this turns out to be almost identical to Izitsu's then operator, um, which actually I had not twigged until I got into this. I had not actually connected those dots um, properly, so that alone was worth the exercise. Um, so compose two takes a pair of functions, f and g, and returns a new function. And the key idea is that f takes an a and gives us a b, g gives us, takes a b and gives us a c, so we can join them together to get from a to b and then b to c. So this gives us a function that takes us from a to c. Um, and it's parameterized on all these types. a, b, and c are these types used um, to define the function types, and then G and F are just the names for the types for F and G. I don't know why they put them in the other order, actually. I would have totally put them as F, G, but um, maybe G and F because of the way the call happens? I don't know, but I think I would have done F, G. Um, and then the implementation is just, um, we make a, we're turning a function, right? So we, re we return a closure that takes an argument of type A, and then we pass that to F, which gives us a thing of type B, and we pass that to G, and that gives us a thing of type C, and then that is what we need. Now, that was all like, yay, I understand. Now, there was this move here, and if you take that move out, uh, you get this problem um, that the because this is probably what I would have written. I wouldn't have thought about the move. I would have just been like, oh, it's a closure that takes a thing. Um, and the problem is that um, F and G are owned by Compose2 and the 
this closure gets returned to someone else who will own it and presumably use it. And that use could be much later. And the problem is that with F and G owned by Compose2, when we get to this curly brace here on line 19, it will free up F and G. Rust will be like, hey, Compose2 owned these two values. Compose2 is done. Anything that Compose2 owned should be free to be freed up. It should be okay to free that up now. So it would try to free up F and G, but F and G are referred to in this closure, and this closure could still be alive, and it could try to refer back to F, and the system's like, ah, oh, F, I got rid of it like weeks ago. Can't do that. Not going to happen. And the compiler's catching that and fussing at us. And the solution in the uh, on this web page here was to have a move here. And move in a position like this says, move anything that's in scope into the closure as needed. And so in particular, F and G, little f and little g, their ownership will move out of compose to and into the closure. So the closure at this point owns the functions F and G. They're no longer owned by compose to. So when Compose2 ends, they don't get freed up because they're still owned by this closure. They wander around with the closure being passed to whoever has the closure, and then they get used when the closure gets used. And it's like, okay, fine. That works well. Except it causes me a problem in a little bit, which we'll get to. Um, and then there was this nifty uh, macro Compose, which I really liked. Um, uh, where we have, um, it applies to an expression. Um, so let's see, where's an example down here. So we could have compose, bang, and then two functions. You can actually have three, four, five functions, which is one of the nifty things. So it extracts, um, if there's just one thing, we return it. If there is a head and a tail, um, then we compose to, that's this function we defined here, with the head and the result of compose bang on the tail. So, um, hey, that, and I don't know what time zone you're in, but it, it's 10, 18 here, and it was, a, it was a tough morning. I was like, oh, I don't want to, partly because I stayed up stupidly late trying to understand some of this stuff. So, um, there, there, it took a little caffeine to get the, the day started. So it's wonderful to see you however and whenever you happen to arrive. Um, so this calls compose to with the head and the results of composing the tail. So we had a nice like recursive composition and I thought that macro was very cool. Um, I don't really use it anywhere down here. I mean, I use it, but I don't, I'll only ever call it with two things. So I don't use it in an interesting way. Um, so all of that, that was cool, like that. So then I was like, okay, well, how does that relate? Let's see, come to here to the and and then operators that uh, Izitsu was proposing um, earlier. And it turns out that then is actually almost identical. Actually, it is identical um, if we leave out the population stuff. What is it who's calling then is really just function composition. And uh, there's a little more to it because of carrying the population around. But if we weren't carrying the population around, um, is it who's then is straight up function composition. So we take two functions and we, we're essentially saying do F, then do G. And it's exactly the same implementation as composed to up here. And that was like, oh my gosh, bells and angels. And yeah, I was, that was definitely a revelatory moment that I had not grokked that relationship. Um, and understanding that helped me a lot. Don't know if it helped anybody else, but it helped me. Um, and then this and, um, 
Oh, and this... There's also this Reddit post where this person basically sort of proposes then as a kind of composition. Um, uh, no, no, no. Yes? Now I don't remember. Yeah, I think so. I think they basically proposed this. Um, so it was similar. The AND operator, um, instead of doing one thing, then another, the idea is to do one thing and another thing in parallel, essentially. And now this is it. So you should totally correct me if I, I'm getting the and wrong. I'm pretty sure I've got the then right, but I'm less certain about whether I my and matches your vision of and. Um, uh, and so if we have F and G that take A to B and C to D respectively, then the AND takes a pair of A and C to a pair of B and D. So we, we're mapping uh, a pair AC, which are the inputs of our two functions, to a pair of BD, which are the outputs of our two functions. Um, and again, it's a pretty straightforward thing. We have a closure that takes the values of type A and C um, and returns F of X and G of Y. Um, ah, okay. So your AND was originally like this, but now it clones a single input and merges the out. So that was one of the things I wasn't sure about is whether AND in your mind was taking two out inputs like this one does, or it was taking a single out input and kind of forking it to two places. Um, so we could... As an alternative, fn uh, cloned and cloning and, and let's see, we would have actually, I'm going to deal with um, f type f, g type g, and we're going to impl a function that takes. A single type A and returns B and D. Um, and you were outputting into an iterator or a vac. For the moment, I'll just output into a tuple and we can tidy up the output business um, later. Um, and so we're going to need <coughs> F is of type A to B. Uh, fn a to b and g is of type fn a to and i guess this could be c here um c and we're gonna move and we're gonna take a single argument x ah and we're gonna return um a tuple which is f of x comma g of x. And then we've got to fill in our bits here. So we are a, b, c, f, and g are all generic types. And it, uh, oh, so this is, where, uh, this is where the clone comes in. So if I, don't do and as it's you said he they cloned and I didn't I forgot that and then lo and behold uh, the world is grumpy at me because we have moved the value into F here because F takes ownership uh, and so we no longer have access to F here X here so we get into a problem and so if we clone this one um, that uh, works, but we need A to be of type clone um, so that uh, we actually can clone it. So it forces us to add the clone type. And so that actually does work. 
Um, so I'll add, we'll add an example of using that in a second, but that's interesting. Okay. Um, so we could have a single thing and we could pass it to two different functions and get a tuple or a vec or a whatever um, of results out the other end. Um, okay, so we've got then, which is just function composition and a couple of notions of and. Does that part make sense to people? Questions about that before we actually try to use it? and run into a problem in a little bit. Okay. So, um, so I just have some examples. So increment is a function that adds one to things, multiply, takes two things and multiplies them together. Um, so increment takes a single I 32 and returns an I 32 multiply takes a tuple of I 32s and returns an I 32. And so, this is just using compose. Um, so we can compose multiply followed by increment uh, <clears throat> where we'll multiply takes two things. Uh, so if we give it three and five, we get 15 and then we increment, we get 16. Um, so if we call combo on the pair three, five, um, it should give us um, 16 and it does. Um, uh, oh, okay. Is this who says there would only be A and B because C would be the same as B so that we could iterate. Oh. Interesting. So F goes from A to B. And G goes from, oh, sure, sure. So I can get away with these being different types because I'm returning a tuple. But if you had a vec or an iterator, these would have to be the same type. Oh, so in fact, if we had fn, um, actually I'm gonna do the iter one because I've got a question about that and this would surface that question. Um, they're different, but they're iterators with the same type. I'm not sure I understand that. Are you saying I said something that was wrong or that you said something that was wrong? I'm not sure. Um, so then, oh, and I don't want a, a, a vector here. I want an iter B, I think. That's what you're talking about. And then uh, A is still going to need to be clonable. F is going to need to be FN A to B. G is going to need to be FN A to C. Um, <laughs> um, oh, so they would both be into iter. Oh. Okay. Let me. Let's get there in a second. Let's see if we can at least make this part work. Um, X of type A, and we're gonna get, okay, oh yeah, and let me f sort out this guy quick. A, B, F, G. Now, how, how did you, um, generate the iter here? Did you actually like put them in a, vec or an array i guess an array would be the thing right so you would have f of x dot clone um g of x to iter iter something like that um 
So you just return to Vec initially. Um, oh yeah, that's not going to be C anymore. That's going to be B. And oh, and we can't return an iter that refers to this temporary variable because that is owned by the closure and won't make it out. Um, so that's awkward. Um, let's see, core slice iter. Uh, where is slice? And we're missing a lifetime specifier because iter needs to know how long things will live, which does relate to this issue. Um, okay. Let's maybe simplify things and just make this a vec. Um, and then we don't get into all the weeds. of lifetimes and everything if we don't need to although maybe that's relevant okay so that's not an iter and that's a vec and and so these have to be the same type because vec can only have a single type if we need them to be different types we could have them into some shared type that's specified here um, but other if we didn't want to go down that road this would be the best we could do um, I think he says so okay um, now I may want to come back and make the clone the iter um, to do make a version of and that returns an iterator. Um, but let's set that aside for a hot minute. Okay. So I've got all these different things. Um, let's see. So this does compose. And because there's only two things here, I could have just used the compose to method directly. Um, and um, now here, uh, I'm doing something a little more complicated. So this is interesting because it takes two things, makes one thing, and then modifies that one thing. Um, Whereas here we're taking two values, modifying them both, and then bringing them together. And that the idea was to try to do something that would use the and feature. Um, and this is uh, doing that with just the compose. Um, and I can do that by having an ink both that takes a pair of values and increments them both. Now that doesn't, that's not really using compose in any way. This is basically doing what our and was doing. Um, and then I can compose ink both and multiply um, and I get 24. If I start with three and five, so I increment them both, I get four and six, multiply them together, I get 24. All of that's nifty. Um, now we'll get to um, actually doing, oh, actually we could have done, what, 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 uh, could I have done, uh, yeah, in theory, I should have been able to do this same thing with, I should have been able to do all of these with the ands and the thens. So let's actually do that to make sure I'm getting what's going on. So let 
uh, combo then, these are terrible names, apologies, um, is multiply dot then increment. Uh, and then let result be combo then uh, three five print line bang the first result using then was result boom ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. and so hey I didn't find oh right okay yeah so we can't do we can't do the dot then yet because we have just defined then as a free floating function and Zitsu's idea is to get us into dot then where that would mean then is a method on some type, some function type. Um, uh, and that's part of where the operator kicks in. So I'm going to ignore that for the hot minute. We'll just do old school then uh, increment. But you could see why um, being able to say multiply dot then increment would be kind of nice. Um, from a readability standpoint, um, but this should work for now. Um, yeah, so that all compiles and, and presumably runs. Uh, there'll be a lot of output here because uh, there's stuff that we aren't using. Yeah, so here's, here's the lines that matter. Um, we got 16 when we did it with just compose and then we got 16 again when we did it with then so woo yay um given that compose and and then are identical definitions this is not surprising um so here we've got this increment both and we compose that um now i think we can do the same thing but with and here um so ink both uh is and of increment increment um and then let combo to be um then ink both followed by multiply and let result two is combo two three five and print line bang the second result using and and then was result and so hopefully that will Oh, result two. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And then we run that. And hopefully we'll get the same answers for those two things. Wada, wada, wada. So that's these two lines here. Lo and behold, everything's great. So, so this is nifty. Um, and especially if we could say increment dot and increment. That's, that's a little weird, um, but whatever. Uh, and then dot then um, that it would if we read it out loud, it would read fairly nicely. Whereas this reads um, in a prefix kind of way that you know isn't impossible, but is less readable out loudable than um, an infix uh, notation would have been. Um, so that works. Yay. That's a thing. Um, and also I think that the and here we're avoiding creating a, um, raw closure, whether that's all that important. I don't know. That's an, you know, we could probably debate that, but, um, uh, then we should be able to also do this with the other versions of and that we've made. So we've got cloning and and vec and. So uh, where am I? 
I want to be here. So we could say ink both is cloning and that takes increment and increment and then combo two is going to be then ink both multiply. Now the there's a difference here in that um, combo two here takes a pair a, two, a pair of i thirty twos, whereas this combo two takes a single i thirty two um, because we're cloning that single i thirty two and passing it to both of the functions. Um, so ink both takes a single argument and then because we uh, it's the first thing in the chain that kind of drives what gets taken everywhere and so again we still just take one argument and so let result two be combo two now we want a single argument we'll say three and print line bang the second result using and and uh, and cloning and and then was result two and now we would expect three would get copied both the threes would get incremented to become fours we would multiply them and we would get 16. So we would expect 16 here. Um, let us see if we get 16. Wah, 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 wah. And indeed we do. So that's correct and happy. Um, and then the last one would be we could do the vec and let ink both equals vec and and vecand takes the two functions, increment and increment, because I'm boring that way. And so now we take a single argument and we return a vector. Um, now multiply isn't going to work here because multiply doesn't take a vector. So we need to define a vecmult. Um, let vecmult be a closure that takes, I'll say, uh, vowels, and we'll just be really brutal about it and say vowels zero times vowels one. And it's like, I don't know what you're doing. So let's say that's a vec i32. And now, yeah. So now we ought to be able to let combo to be then ink both vecmult and then let result to be combo two of three. And we ought to get the same result uh, 24 that, or 16 that we had before. Second result using vec and and then was result two boom so everybody compiles fingers crossed let's run this and we got 16 here and we got 16 here so great so both of those work and life is spiffy. So that's interesting. So we don't have the iterator one yet, but let's come back to that after we sort out some other issues. This is a piece I don't understand that may be related. I don't know because there's some ownership problems downstream. Um, so... Okay, so all of this worked. Everything was swell. However, I was always just taking um, simple values, I-32s, as inputs. 
and I wanted to um, move toward something like selectors and understand how they fit into all of this. Um, so I started with uh, just creating some constant um, closures that always return the same value. So I've got a function always here that takes a value and returns a closure that takes unit as an argument and always returns that value. Um, and did I, uh, I felt like I needed the unit so there was something to pass in at the beginning. Um, because yeah, cause I think our function types all have an input type. And so you need something, um, if you're going to use this in a composition, I think there has to be an input type. You can't just have, uh, vertical bar, vertical bar here. Um, because then the composition doesn't work. Um, whereas this lets us say this effectively takes no arguments. Um, uh, but we do pass in a unit type. Um, and so always three is a function that always returns three. Always five is a function that always returns five. Um, and those work. zippity doo -da, That's actually right down here that they do the right thing. So then I could compose things like always three and increment. And that gives me a function that takes basically nothing, a unit, and gives me an i32. So it's going to give me 3 plus 1 is 4. So that's in my little ASCII art right here. And then combo 4 does the same thing with 5. That's this part here. Um, and then I can build up more interesting things and say let's and the combo 3 and 4 and then multiply. So this would be in Izitsu's sort of universe. It would look more like this. It'd be combo three and combo four, then multiply. Um, so I want to do both of these things and then multiply. And since they everything starts with a unit type, these can actually basically introduce new values de novo into the world in the way that selection would um, bring new genomes into a pipeline um, in sort of the target universe. And this works. Um, so we can do then and combo three, combo four, multiply, um, and we get 24. Um, and that is being printed. This is the third result. So that's right here. So that works fine. Okay. <clears throat> So I was like, oh, that's awesome. So let's fancy this. Oh, and then I've got some notes here about macros. I, I had this, I was wondering if we could, instead of doing all the trait stuff, use macros to try to get to here instead um, to have a macro that rewrote this to this. I am no expert on Rust macros, but I think the answer is no. Because essentially what I want, would want to do is have then be a macro. So it'd be like then bang. And I don't think you can do that. I think, don't think you can have dot, you know, blah, 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 dot, and then a macro. I think the macros have to be at the front. So I think you would have to have, if you wanted to do stuff with macros, the syntax would have to look like this, where the operators were at the front instead of, um, in the dot form. And I think that one of the, oops, no, one of the values of this is the readability of kind of the left or right syntax. Um, and I don't think we can do that with macros in Rust. Like I said, I am absolutely not an expert in Rust macros. I have read a little and used less. Um, but the reading I did do seemed to suggest that that was not something we could do, um, which made me slightly sad, but there we are. 
Now, I don't know, I, you know, procedural macros, you can do some pretty crazy things. So maybe um, you could have something like, um, 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 I don't know, I'm just gonna call it something stupid. So pipeline, bang. So maybe you could do something like this. Okay, I'm gonna have to close this curtain here because I can't see my own screen anymore. Momentary pause. Boo. Okay. That'll be a little less bright. Um, so we could possibly, I mean, given that they've done HTML this way and other stuff, I'm guessing that you could do something like this and it would go through and look for dot thens and dot ands and then rearrange the text and put it all back together again um, in this form. But I think it would have to be something like that and not a dot then bang. Um, oh, oh, interesting. So dot then bang was, would be a post fix macro. There were discussions about it back when a weight was being proposed but I don't think anything has happened with the idea. I didn't run across anything that looked like that, but I didn't search for postfix macro. I didn't think about that as a name to search for. So it's possible that I um, uh, didn't grok. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know to search for that, so I may have missed it, but I didn't see anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, is this really useful? I mean, so I think the question is, is it, how complex does the trait system have to be versus having just a macro that does the stuff, the rearranging, and we don't need a bazillion traits? Um, oh, and we have a, uh, oh, come on. Let me grab, oh, yeah, computer hating me. Um, uh, is it too shared this URL, which is still open? Okay. So there's an RFC for PostFit fixed macros, it is still open, which means like they haven't turned it down completely, but it's also not something that's been done. And there we go. I wonder what the latest ver state of the world is. Um, hmm, it looks like there's an implementation, but it hasn't been pulled in. Interesting. Well, um, I don't know. Um, I don't think I feel strongly about it one way or the other. Um, but I did feel like there was a lot of machinery in having like the mutate trait and the mutator and the select trait and the selector and the operator. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on. And I think that the, the question is going to be how much of that stuff <clears throat> can just be, for people using this in the future, how much of that stuff will be, excuse me, <clears throat> how much of that stuff do they have to know and use versus how much of it is <clears throat> um, previously imp implemented support tooling that they just get for free and don't have to think about it, right? <clears throat> so if it's like all the cool tools that are available in Iter, um, for on iterators like filtering and folding and all of that stuff, and if we can implement that and then they could just use it, that's great, right? That's clearly worth the trouble. But if, on the other hand, there's a lot of stuff they have to implement if they want to add things or use things, then the cost of doing that might be worth thinking about. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we'll press on for a while and see where we end up. Um, 
So that was a thought that I had is, you know, where macro is possibly a thing here. <clears throat> but now we, we're about to get to the thing that where stuff blew up for me. Um, and which I do not know. Um, uh, yeah. So if that's how it works out, is it too? I totally agree. That would be awesome. Uh, and I'm happy to have us build complicated scaffolding if they don't have to see it or interact with it a lot. Um, if, th if what they have to do is simple, great. Life is good. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy pressing on with that. Um, so here I got to a place where I was stuck. So I defined random items which took a referent, a slice of I-32 called choose on that, which chooses a random value. Um, I just brutally unwrapped that because choose returns an option um, because if the slice is empty, uh, we might get none. And I was just like, I'm just try playing around, trying to make sure I understand how stuff works. So I just unwrapped it. And now that is going to give me here a reference to an I-32 but I want an actual I-32, so I dereference it here. And that gives me a function that takes a slice of I-32s and gives me an I-32. zippity doo -dah. So then I define combo three, which is composing random item and increment. Could have used then as well. It would have been the same thing. Um, and uh, combo four... I don't know why that's commented out. Let's bring that back. Boop -a -doop -a -doo. And composes random item increment again, which is kind of a little weird because it's exactly the same thing, but whatever. I'm not going to worry about it right now. And then combo five um, does an and. So it's a, it's a little weird. I'm using compose bang here and I'm using the then and here but they all sort of match up so it shouldn't matter so I'm saying let's and combo three and combo four so we're going to get two random items and increment each of them and then we're going to multiply them together so this is not deterministic anymore because we're getting a random item but we should get two random items and multiply them together. Oh, two random items, increment them, and multi multiply them together. Okay, that seemed like a deal. So then I made a vector of um, I-32s and another vector of I-32s. My naming is clearly terrible. Apologies. Blah, blah, blah. Then this takes, my combo five, takes a pair of slices because one slice is going to go into compose three and do its random item. And the other slice is going to go into combo four and do its random item. So I need a pair of slices. So um, I do that here. Uh, so ampersand vowels bracket dot dot turns the vector into a slice for me. And so I get a pair of slices. All of that looks great. Print. All that looks great. Um, and this is the sort of ASCII art that I'm shooting for. Um, so we're going to have, um, uh, our two slices. Each is going to give us a random item. I'm going to just call those X and Y because we don't know what they're going to be. We're going to add one. So we'll get X plus one and Y plus one. And then we're going to multiply. So we should get X plus one quantity times Y plus one quantity, except it doesn't work. And in fact, it doesn't work even here. If I just call combo three, oh, I think that's maybe why those were commented out. If I call combo three with my slice <coughs> um, here, uh, this borks with a message I don't fully grasp. Um... Was this the one? Because this is slightly different. 
message. Um, yeah, it's this. It's this. Does not live long enough. This is the thing that was killing me. Um, this is different. Where are we using combo three again? That part I'm confused about. Oh, because we passed ownership of it here. Okay, so let's actually make, comment those guys out. Okay, here's the message I totally don't understand. Uh, is it to caught that? Um, so Val's does not live long enough. Values in a scope are dropped in the opposite order that they are defined. Values dropped here while still borrowed. Borrow may be used here, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I'm assuming the problem is, uh, something to do with the move in compose. Um, so this move here, although the same thing would happen if we had then, cause we still have the move and that's, it's a guess. Um, but it's the only guess I've got that makes any sense is that somehow vowels is being a, the reference to vowels is being moved into a closure and it's worried that vowels will be dropped before the closure evaluates. Um, but I don't quite get why or how that could be. And everything I have tried has failed to resolve the problem and searching has gotten me nowhere. So if somebody has a thought on why that might be, man, I would love to be enlightened because I am totally befuddled. Um, and searching did not turn up um, useful stuff. It was mostly in the context of threading, where I understand that you could get a, um, you could capture a reference in a closure, pass that to a thread, and have no idea when that closure is going to be evaluated. Um, but here, like, we know this is being evaluated here, and I don't quite see, and like, if I do, let result be combo three vowels and then make this result. That doesn't change, improve anything. We get the same problem. It just moves it to a different place. So somehow the evaluation of combo three doesn't seem to finish or get to a point where it doesn't need the reference to vowels anymore or that the compiler can tell that it doesn't need vowels anymore. Um, and so then it's worried and, and it, you know, it talks about the order in which things are dropped. And so I'm guessing, let's find out actually, um, that if I moved all of this copy, I'm going to comment that out. If I moved all of that down after the input stuff, that maybe that would fix the problem, but that's not a, oh, whoa, hello. Mismatch types, expected unit, but found reference. Oh, I, I copied the wrong ones. Duh, I get it. Let's go back to here. Now, so it's this that I want to cop grab a copy of comment out. If I put it down here, then I'm guessing the problem will go away because we would free up combo and then free up vowels and life is good. Um, but that's clearly not desirable because you want to actually be able to build the pipeline first and then 
apply it to values. So like saying you have to build the pipeline after you've defined your values is clearly not going to be acceptable. So Izitsu has a suggestion of debug bang vowels at the end. Okay. Debug bang prints and returns the value for quick and dirty debugging. Well, okay. Cannot move uh, because it's borrowed. Um, borrow might be used here. Try and valves. Sure. And it still doesn't compile. And I get the same error. Yeah. Uh, so. I don't get why combo <coughs> three is eating my value. Now, I will say that. I, in my searching, I did find, and so if this is true, then we don't really want to spend more time on this, but I did find in my searching that there was indications that may, there were certain circumstances where um, ownership, when the, the, the compiler thought things were going to be dropped, at the wrong time and that it was possibly a bug in the Rust compiler. And there are some open questions about that floating around in um, like the Rust discussion discourse. Um, I never like assuming that I'm right and that the compiler's wrong. I mean, that's, I think, just a fool's errand. Um, but it is, I guess, nimbly possible that I found some weird edge case. Um, in which case we definitely don't want to dwell on it. Um, I was hoping that somebody here might um, uh, magically go, oh, that's a who's he, what's it problem. Do this and it will all get better. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of uh, m proposals of magic who's he, what's it solutions. So maybe this is something we don't want to be thinking about right now. Um, and hopefully... Uh, it won't be an issue um, in the real system um, for some other magic reason. I don't know. That also doesn't make me feel super comfortable because um, I don't like magic reasons. Uh, but I really don't know why this is happening, and I don't know how to make it not happen. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's all a little weird. Um I guess it might be interesting to try um, just for fun. I mean, it really shouldn't change anything because then is basically the same as composed to. Yeah, so that didn't change anything. Uh, so it just doesn't like passing that reference in. Now, one thing I thought about, because if we go back up to then, um, I, I wondered, so I felt like maybe the move was the problem. Somehow move was trapping X in some way, but I don't think that's true. I don't think I think move only affects out things outside of the closure. X is just an argument to the closure, and it shouldn't matter. Um, let me actually try instead of a closure. Let me try actually defining a function, um, uh, and see if that somehow changes things. Uh, boom! So I want this to be fn random item. Uh, 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 uh. This is going to return i32 
Okay, so now that defines a function random item. Now can we use it instead of our closure? And does that change anything? And the answer is no. We have exactly the same error. So that didn't alter a thing. And that doesn't have the move business in it. So it isn't about the move and the closure. Um, so I am totally befuddled. Now, and I feel like I tried this. I think if I tried like cloning the value uh, that 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 didn't make any difference because I was thinking maybe somehow there's still a yeah that doesn't change anything so I'm quite befuddled about this. Um, since nobody else has got any great thoughts, I will, we don't want to spend the rest of today on this. I will write something about this up and post it on the, um, the Rust discourse board and see if somebody there has some bright idea. Because this is like very confusing and... and um, I don't know what's going on. So uh, we will ignore that for the moment because um, I'm befuddled and nobody else seems to have a great thought on the matter. So um, I will ask the... Oh, increment is... Where's increment? Right here. Now we could try making increment a uh, a standalone function instead of a closure on the off chance that that matters to something. Um, and no, same error. So that didn't change anything. So I don't think that I, I, I'm, I'm my suspicion is the closures are not the problem. Um, but I don't know what the problem is. That's frustrating. Um, okay. Well, then, um, Let me set this aside and uh, I want to try to make sure I understand uh, is Zitsu's reasonably complicated at least in my brain at the moment, design um, for operator and all of the people. Oh, what else did we pass in? The combo three, oh, at the end, where are we here? Combo three is a then of random item and increment, which are now the, func the standalone functions and not um, the uh, closures. And so we get back. Uh, well, hello, Gatha. Um, we are we are fighting with some weirdness in closure. Um, uh, so let me I'll, I'll explain this one more time um, because maybe 
you will see something that, that we have missed. Um, there's a lot here, so I'm going to skip. I'm going to try to jump around and just do the, the minimal bits. But um, combo three is basically a function composition of this function and that function. Um, and random item and increment are both defined up here. So random item takes a slice of i32s and returns an i32. Increment takes an i32 and adds ones to it. One adds one to it. So this composition down here basically says pick a random item, add one to it, and return that. All of that works. Well, okay. All of, then works in other settings. I, I, and random item and increment both work. So we, I think the pieces here work. The problem is if I get... Um, if I define a vec of values, so vec of i32s, and we don't need any of this right now, and I pass that, a reference to that as a slice to combo, I get an error that I do not understand. So for some reason it thinks that vals doesn't live long enough um, and that combo three may be dropped while it still holds a reference to vowels. But combo three has been evaluated here and we have, we don't need it anymore. Um, and combo three as a definition makes no reference to vowels. It only knows about vowels through this call. And so I am completely befuddled as to why that's happening. Um, so, uh, and nobody else has had any um, light bulb moments either. So my plan is to write this up on the Rust discourse, see if somebody there has some thought um, and allow us to move on since it's already 20 past. Um, uh, and I'm still trying to like make sense out of some stuff. So, um, do you, will Gaffa have any ideas on this or is this just all like whatever? Um, okay. Uh, Same error. Yep. Same error. Blah. And now it pushed the error up here. I have seen this before. Because I think I tried um, uh, something like this uh, last night. And it's interesting that it pushes the error up it's the same error, it's just it marks it in a different place. Um, computers, computers, so annoying, computers. Oh. <sighs> Try declaring vowels above combo three. Yeah, so um, we did this and That does seem to make the problem go away, but that's fundamentally not great because we want to be able to define pipelines early and then use them later on. And this, this is saying basically you'd have to define your pipelines after you declare whatever values the pipelines act on. Well, that doesn't seem good. 
Now, it's possible that in a real system, it would all work out. Like maybe the ownership and the references would all be different and it would all be fine and we wouldn't have to worry about it. But um, it smells like a bad choice to me. Uh, but it does fix the problem. So I should actually make a note of that to remind myself when I write up the... Um, uh, if we put the declaration of vowels before the declaration of combo three, everything is good. Um, we just don't want to be forced to define them in that order. And actually, let me make sure things actually run. I mean, I think they do, but um, one, 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 one. And so the Yeah, so three is the result of calling combo three blah. So it presumably chose two and incremented it. And vowels is still there. And if I run it again, I likely get a different value because there's randomness. Yeah, so the value is two, so it must have chosen one returned it so this does actually work it's just not a helpful solution um, and if I put this back and this here now we get the error again blah, blah, blah. so I'm confused sigh um, And as I said, I think before you joined in Wagafa, there is a dim possibility that this is actually a compiler problem. I saw in my searching some references, some conversations about the compiler sometimes getting befuddled about um, things that looked not like this, but things that had met something like this at a party. Um, and that's why, you know, A, deciding to blame the compiler is, is just never a good strategy in my experience. Um, and uh, B, they didn't, look, they didn't look that close to this, so I don't know. But I'll put, like I said, I'll post something on Discourse and um, we'll hope that somebody... Oh, I tried that too. Um... So let's see, because I was thinking that if I did some scoping, maybe that would make things better. Um, so let's see, I tried... Um, like this, I think. Let's let's comment this out. And that didn't change anything. Uh, let's see. We try. We could try putting bleh in the new scope. That didn't fix anything. Um, I guess we could go all the way up to the top here. Uh, yeah. I, nothing. Okay, so let's see. You're you're thinking 145 to 153. Is that basically what I just did? I think. Um, in which case, yeah, it didn't didn't fix anything. Um, and I tried a variety. Um, yeah, stare away, man. Um, I tried a variety of different bracket locations and none of them changed anything. I always got the same thing. 
So there's something weird going on about the closure being generated by then and the argument, but I don't, I don't know what it is. So that's been exciting. Um, uh, I feel a little better about not figuring out what was going on. Um, but, uh, yeah. Ah, <sighs> sigh. Sigh, sigh, sigh. Thank you, go away. Um, obviously, I have to simplify this a lot. Um, before I, uh, post it, but luckily I think there's a pretty simple subset of this that reveal the issue. Um, so hopefully somebody will have a thought, um, and, and it's weird because then demonstrably works in the examples farther up. Um, it's somehow having something that takes a reference to um, a set of values that blows the world up. That's the thing that, that kills it. Um, so. Blah, 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 blah. Is where there should be like sad background music. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so uh, we got half an hour. Let's not spend more time on this because I think that is probably not the best use of our energies. So I want to actually. The, the whole point of this, uh, for those that joined later, is I was trying to better understand, let's come back up here, Zitsu's recombination tools. Um, so Zitsu had um, a then operator, which was basically just function composition. So it takes two functions and returns the comp a closure that is a composition of those functions. So it takes an X and then computes G of F of X. Um, and, uh, and then several versions of and um, have been uh, wrestled with. Um, I had been thinking as it's who meant this version, but it turned out as it's who really meant something more like this version or this version. Um, although there's actually an, version that returns an iterator that I think is the, is it's whose current version, um, which we don't have yet. Um, and I was trying to make sure I understood those design decisions. Um, and that's how I got into sort of, com you know, I was composing things. So I would have examples to look at. Um, and, uh, then didn't get there. Um, uh, that's weird. So I think your version of the chat is different than mine. Like there is a message, but right above, yeah, I had that thought as well from Mugafa. It shows up as a little pink thing here that I do not see that message. I see that it exists in, in my screen, but um, I do not see it uh, in my actual sort of streaming thing. And so I have no idea what that person said. Um, and I apologize. If you're the person with the pink right above Wagafa's comment, I apologize for not having any idea what you said because I just see it in teeny, teeny print that I cannot read. Um, I wonder if I blow this window up enough. Does that become... Ah. 
Oh, what about Future Highway said? What, why this didn't show up? I don't know. What about an explicit drop vowels in 153? Well, let's find out. Um, uh, especially since two people have the thought. Um, oh, come on. 153. Let's do, 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 do. Um, so drop vowels. And no. So let's actually do I have oh I don't have a terminal. Let me give myself a terminal quick. Um that is a little bigger and in the right directory. Um and let's make the text bigger so that we can see what we're doing. Um, can I move? So the borrow occurred there. And the move out of vowels occurred here. Borrow might be used on line 160. So this is one of the things, this seems to imply that when we run the destructor for combo three, that somehow vowels might need to be referred to, and I don't get that at all. So let's see, we'll take bleh out of it, since that didn't seem to make any difference. Um, and this has got to be ampersand. And yeah, it seems to think somehow that destructing combo three might need to refer to vowels. And I don't understand how or why that would ever be the case. Totally befuddled. Totally, totally befuddled. And so if it's a struct, great. Um, but then why... So combo three is the result of then on these two functions. So then is here. So it's this closure. And the closure itself shouldn't hold any reference to vowels. Um, I wonder if I called, what if I called combo three with a second value Nope, exactly the same set of errors. So you're saying as long as combo three is alive, it holds a reference to vowels. Why? I don't think I understand. So let's see. Combo three is a then. So it should just be a closure. And you wouldn't want a closure to hold like every argument it had ever been passed. That seems bad. 
Um, Yeah, that, so, and I thought about, like, trying to do some stuff with Lifetimes here, um, and, because it does smell like a Lifetime problem, right, um, but I wasn't sure, like, you can't, I don't know how to specify a Lifetime of a closure argument. And I think I did some searching, and I think the answer was you can't. That there's actually a, an RFC, or there was the idea of doing something like that, but that that's not what's actually happening. Um, so, because it's the lifetime of X that seems to matter here. Um, because... It's vowels that's the argument that seems to not live long enough. Um, and that that's the argument in then. And that it's somehow this lifetime is. Um, yeah, so I guess we could, right? So we could write combo three instead of using then um well actually let me make sure i understand what you're suggesting so combo three takes these two functions um oh and then just use them internally sure so let's we'll try that um Fun combo three takes uh, a um, and it calls increment on random item of vowels. So I'm guessing this is what you mean here. Um, oh, oh, so you're, instead of joining these together, you're saying use, use then here. So then random vowels increment vowels like that. Boo. A random item. Da, 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 da. Can't type. So I is that what you're shooting for? And then if that's what you're aiming for, then we would uh, comment out combo three here and did I get combo three wrong? I got the types wrong. No. Oh, uh, yes, there probably is. There's probably several combo threes floating around. Um, yeah, right, one, there's one right here. And that's shadowing our little friend. Okay. Terrible names, terrible names, terrible names. Oh, and then this um, now. Oh, that's interesting. So this combo five uses that combo three. Oh, but that combo three did something different. So let me just comment all of this out. And we'll skip over all of that and we'll come down here. Do, 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 Yeah, terrible names here. Terrible, terrible names. Is that, like, happy? Um, okay, that's weird. That seems to be, like, good? With that version of combo three. 
let's run it. Yeah. Uh, so two and 12. So that's these two prints here. Yeah, so it's choosing a random value and adding one. A random value from this could have been one, add one, get two. Random value this could have been 11, add one, get 12. Well, let's try dropping the, getting, rid of the drop vowels and it seems happy let's try running it again yep 4 and 12 yeah that's entirely plausible well that's Fascinating. So combo three as a function works fine. But combo three defined on the fly does not. And that in some sense probably doesn't affect us because I don't think we are likely to be generating these things through closures he says not really being very certain of that at all um i think it's still something worth asking about um because it does seem to me like these um oh here we go let combo three ah so instead of this so let's comment that out and we want this combo three let combo three equals x then ran, uh, random item increment applied to x Oh, need a semicolon. Yeah, fine. Boom. Ah, isn't that interesting? And run. Yeah, plausible values. And this is exactly the kind of thing that I would expect Clippy to, in fact, fuss about. Because I think I've seen fussing from Clippy that about creating closures unnecessarily. Who knows what else? There are probably so many things Clippy's not happy about. Um in that code. Um, oh, hang on. Let's um, clear the world. So, uh, so there's a must use, no big deal. Could be using self, yeah, fine. Using an unwrap, don't care right now. Try dereferencing instead so i think i didn't need the clone and that if i just dereferenced it it would copy it okay but none of that is saying anything about um this which i feel like here i'm going to move the curtain again because the sun is moving and i now can't see the screen oh come on let go let go that's better um a closure that then just applies a function to the argument really ought to be the same as the function. 
Um, and so, Azitsu, you said you think it's perhaps a limitation of impul fun. Um, so, essentially, all these returns, things that are returning impul funds, you think there's something happening here that's ca causing us the problem. Um, perhaps. Well fascinating but it's kind of cool that we actually like found a way around the problem um i think that you know while this is ugly it at least works and that's nice um so we can uh press on um from here with that and i like i said i'll post something and i'll let people know on Discord, if I learn anything, um, I'll try to remember to say something about it here uh, when we next get together for this on Sunday. Um, but um, uh, I might, I can imagine forgetting. It's a long time between now and Sunday and I have a small brain um, uh, with increasingly few functioning gray cells. So um, the gray moves out of the inside of your head to the outside of your head as you get old. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. It's quarter till I, so actually I have a question for Azitsu. Um, if Azitsu feels up to, um, taking the question at the moment. So um, let me go back to here. Now, your operator type takes an input and a pop as generics, has an associated output type, and has an apply operator that basically maps this from an input to an output with the population floating around in there. Um, and FN more or less does the same thing minus the population bit. Is there an argument for using operator versus FN other than including the population? Like if we only cared about the recombination operators and we didn't try to include the selection operators in the set of pipeline tools, would there be a reason to not just use FN instead of introducing a new thing? Um, one argument for introducing a new thing I can think of is that um, it might give us better naming, like FN's really very abstract and um, we could have you know, names like operator and apply that maybe would be a little, would capture what's happening in the space a little better. I don't know, right? That's probably a debatable thing. But I was wondering if there was some other argument um, for uh, using operator versus just using the built-in FN um, that you had thoughts on. And this might not be the best place to have that conversation, but I'm curious. Um, you would likely want named types so you can deal with send and sync. Otherwise, you can't really name the function and have to use impl fun send sync. And we want these to be, for folks that weren't here a million years ago when this was, a lot of this was written, we need send and sync because we want to be able to process, to generate new individuals in parallel. So we're currently using Rayon um, and doing some fairly uh, par iter, simple par iter stuff, which allows the system to generate new individuals in parallel, which is a huge win, sort of improves the performance a lot. So we need send and sync everywhere. Um, 
Oh, you know, that's right. And I think I think I had this thought and I lost it. Um, I think that maybe was the thing that seemed the, the most compelling is that you can't impl FN on your own type. So you need a separate trait. And that's important because that's the only way we get uh, the ability to do... Um, Where's my example of this? Too much stuff. Um, oh, it's here, right. Um, with what we have, we are forced to do syntax like this, prefix syntax. And what we would like is something like this. And that would require impling fn to add then and multiply. And we can't do that. That's, I think, the real argument for why it makes sense to have another type, is we want to be able to impl things like and and then. I have them currently just as free-floating functions. Um, but we would want these to be impled on some type so we can do this kind of chaining. And that's probably really why we need an FN. I mean, need our own type. So that's why the operator type makes sense because it allows us to hang things on it that we can't hang things on a raw FN. So if we went with a raw FN, we can't add send and sync we can't impl things like and and then um, we're stuck. Um, whereas if we have our own operator type, it can be send and sync and it can have its own. We can impl things like and and then onto it. Um, and so that actually makes, I think, a lot of sense. Um, and so uh, I'm actually going to make a note that the big advantage of having our own trait operator instead of a raw fn is that we can attach things to it. We can make it send plus sync um, and we can impl operator bum, 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 to add things like and and then that we can't add to fn okay um, um I'll make a note that we might also want clone. So yeah. Um, oh. And and then are not in the operator trait. Oh, because they they don't. Mm. Actually, um, needs to be a separate trait or on the structs directly. And I think if I go back here to operator, um, we have... So we impl operator for then in the code that we have so far. So we're not adding the then method to operator because, oh yeah, because then holds a couple of things, different pieces might hold different content. And so actually we implement operator for these things um, rather than adding 
these two operators. But we still wouldn't be able to say impl. Uh, well, no, we could say impl fn for then here. I think. Yes. Um, is that true? Yeah, probably could. Um, but the ability to add things like send and sync, which we could not do to FN, that actually is probably pretty important. So let me make, fix my notes. Um, so this is wrong. Um, so let's... Um, uh, things like then will implement operator. It's possible they could also just implement fn. Let's actually check that quick. We got a few minutes. Um, so where's my where's my explorer? So in theory, oh, so you can't impl fn. Uh, because I think um, so fn's a trait. Why couldn't we impl it for a thing? Or is fn not a trait? Is that actually my problem? Uh, whoa, go away, go away. Um, yeah, there's there's fn fn once and fn mute. Um, so what rust trait? Oh, I, I that's what my problem. I searched for one of this. Yeah, so it's a trait. So why couldn't we impl that? Um, is it because of this business here that call is kind of already cooked in and oh so maybe that's not relevant to us Scroll down and see the FN traits comment. Uh, FN traits. Oh, here we go. Oh, so call. So we can't implement the call method. So there's no way for us to impl FN because we can't implement the calling. So there's that sort of cooked in down in the low levels of the universe and we can't override it by impling FN ourselves. Interesting. Okay. That's worth noting as well. Um, uh, no, no, we can't. The call method is nightly only, which means we can't implement it ourselves. Um, ooh, note how you reference fn with round 
parentheses, not angle brackets, because the actual structure of the tra trait might change internally. Uh, Oh, you mean, I think these parens here. Ah, wow, okay. Nothing like wandering into the deep end and finding that it's full of 22 sharks, but, um, and then I could read the relevant section of the Rustonomicon to learn more. Um, I don't know that I'll do that right now. But, okay, let's call it quits. I think that um, we have, I've learned some things. Um, I'm also confused about some things, but I've learned some things. I will post uh, about this whole mess um, and see if somebody out in the world can help us understand what's going on. And I will uh, share back if and when I know something. Um, so Discord... QR code over on the left. Um, if you've got comments, questions, or cool ideas, um, we will be streaming in tomorrow, Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. Advent of Code. We managed to um, uh, finish on Saturday the parsing, uh, which was, as Wagafa suggested, that was exciting, um, but I think we got that in a good place. So I think the rest of at least part one of day five should be pretty fast. Um, and then I don't know what part two looks like because I haven't looked at it. Uh, but we'll pick that up on Wednesday and then Saturday, um, uh, 2 to 4 p.m., more Advent of Code. Hopefully we'll be on day six then, but who knows? And then we'll come back to this Sunday, 10 to noon, um, uh, evolutionary computation in Rust. Um, and I will attempt to make sure that um, I have my head wrapped around this stuff and I've posted the question on Discourse. Um, and hopefully then we will work on implementing the operator trait and the um, rec the combinators like then and and um, and begin to build up uh, some reasonable pipelines um, and that would be cool um, and uh, then we can move on to uh, making sure that Childmaker is in good shape. And assuming that's the case, I really would like to get to trying to do uh, some actual genetic programming and evolving computer programs instead of just bit strings. Um, but we've got to get generalize the code in the right ways to be able to handle you know, these quite different uh, application do domains. So. You are all awesome people. Thank you very much for your feedback and your help. I apologize for missing the, the one comment. I don't know why um, this uh, Twitch studio decided just to not share that comment. Luckily, it was in a different enough color that I sort of realized it was happening. Um, and also, Wagafa's comment about, yep, I was thinking about that, helped make me wonder if I had missed something somewhere. So huge apologies if uh, I um, missed a comment of yours uh, along the way. I really don't know why that might have happened. But thank you, Future Highway, for the comment, and apologies for not having seen it. Thank everybody for all of your time and your patience and your feedback on this weird mess. Um, but I think we made progress. Um, and I look forward to coming back to it later. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. We'll do some Advent of Code fun. Talk to you later. Goodbye.